This video includes many topics from 6.7 to 6.13. Energy from biomass, solar energy, hydroelectric power, geothermal energy, hydrogen fuel cell, wind energy, and energy conservation. For developed and developing nations, energy is a requirement for our lives as we know them. Whether on an individual or family, small subsistence scale, or a societal, large commercial scale, we all need energy. As we already know, transportation and electricity are the two biggest categories of energy consumption. And because of that, research and development in the field of energy sustainability would have the greatest potential impact on those areas. Most energy production still requires the combustion of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas for electricity, and oil for transportation fuels. The use of those resources is destructive to the environment in a variety of ways, not limited to the climate change impacts of excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Even proponents of fossil fuel use recognize the damage done to natural habitats and the effects to human health. Efforts to produce energy in more sustainable ways has gained traction in the last decade or so, thanks to a prioritization of cleaner technologies. But as with any type of resource use, they come with both advantages and disadvantages that may be environmental, economic, logistic, or some combination of those three. Although renewable energy uses a small portion of global energy consumption, it is the fastest growing category of energy production. From 2000 to 2020, renewable energy grew an average of 14% each year. Compare this to the growth of natural gas during that same time period of only 2.4% per year, and coal and oil dropping by 0.5 and 0.6 per year, respectively. An energy resource is considered to be renewable if the rate of its use is less than the rate it forms or becomes available. Renewable energy resources are further broken down into non-depletable and potentially renewable resources. Those that are non-depletable will never run out, at least from the perspective of our species. Non-depletable resources include wind, solar, hydro, geothermal, and tidal power. For a potentially renewable resource to be considered actually renewable, its consumption or use must be less than the rate at which it regenerates. Great examples of resources like these include wood and biofuels. While it may not be readily apparent, the sun is connected, either directly or indirectly, to many types of energy resources. Millions of years ago, ancient forests captured energy from the sun, incorporating it into their biomass. Their anaerobic decomposition gave rise, millions of years later, to the coal that we've mined since the start of the Industrial Revolution. A similar history was shared by aquatic organisms that have provided the oil and natural gas we rely on today. So, in an indirect way, over vast expanses of time, Fossil fuels have been made possible by the sun. But those are not the only solar-connected energy sources, however. This next part of the diagram outlines the connections between the sun and various types of energy production. For example, solar power uses light energy from the sun directly. But the movement of air masses, wind in other words, is made possible by the differential heating of the Earth's surface and atmosphere. Hydroelectric power works because water flows downhill due to gravity, but it is solar energy that drives the water cycle, evaporating water so it can condense as clouds and fall as precipitation. The only energy productions that don't share a connection with the sun are nuclear power, made possible by the decay of radioactive isotopes of certain elements, Geothermal power, which relies on the intense heat generated by the pressure deep beneath the Earth's crust. And tidal power, which is driven by the gravitational pull of the moon. A quickly growing sector of energy production, solar energy grew by approximately 29% per year from 2011 to 2020. 
Solar technologies are broadly characterized as either active solar or passive solar, depending on the way they capture, convert, and distribute solar energy. Active solar technologies encompass solar thermal energy, using solar collectors for heating, and solar power, converting sunlight directly into electricity using photovoltaics, or PV. Passive solar technologies, which we'll explore somewhat a bit later in this video, include things like orienting a building into the sun, or selecting materials with favorable thermal mass or light dispersing properties, and designing spaces that naturally circulate air. A PV system converts light into direct electric current by taking advantage of the photoelectric effect. Be sure to check out the video linked above to learn more about how PV works. Solar PV has turned into a multi-billion dollar fast-growing industry, and it continues to improve its cost-effectiveness, having the most potential of any renewable technology combined with concentrated solar power, or CSP. CSP systems use lenses or mirrors, along with tracking systems, to focus a large area of sunlight into a small beam. Commercial CSP plants were first developed in the 1980s. A system like this consists of an array of sun tracking reflectors, or heliostats, that concentrate sunlight on a central receiver atop a tower. The receiver contains a heat transfer fluid, which can consist of a material like molten salt. The fluid in the receiver is heated to up to 1000 degrees Celsius and then used as a heat source for a power generation or energy storage system. The heat from the hot molten salt is used in a steam generator to produce steam, which turns a turbine connected to a generator. Unlike photovoltaics, the power generation from solar thermal storage plants is self-sustainable, similar to fossil fuel-fired power plants, but without the pollution. Although the cost to produce electricity using solar power has decreased significantly in recent years, it's still more expensive than electricity generated by fossil fuels. And this is especially true for CSP systems. For PV systems, energy storage is an ongoing problem since, when it's not a particularly sunny day or nighttime, enough electricity isn't being produced to meet demand, if at all. Production and installation of PVs does cause pollution and greenhouse gas emissions, and there are no viable systems for recycling the panels once they're at the end of their lifespan after up to 30 years. The sector of renewable energy with the highest electricity power generation is, by far and away, hydropower. The world's hydroelectric dams produce almost as much electricity as all other renewable energy combined. In Washington state, about two-thirds of electricity production is by the state's dams, but globally about 16% of renewable electricity generation is hydroelectric. The principle of hydroelectric power is pretty simple. Moving water is used to rotate a turbine connected to a generator. Therefore, dams are most often built on rivers to collect water on the reservoir side of the dam, which is then channeled through the dam and its turbines. Some examples of famous dams include Hoover Dam on the Colorado River, completed in 1936, which generates 2,000 megawatts of electricity. The Grand Coulee Dam in Washington on the Columbia River opened in 1942 and is the highest capacity dam in North America at almost 7,000 megawatts. And the Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River in China, which opened in 2003, has an electric capacity of over 22,000 megawatts. A tidal barrage, like the one seen here on the Rons River in France, is a dam-like structure used to capture the energy from masses of water moving in and out of a bay or river due to tidal forces. Instead of damming water on one side like a conventional dam, a tidal barrage allows water to flow into a bay or river during high tide and releases the water during low tide. 
This is done by measuring the tidal flow and controlling the sluice gates at key times of the tidal cycle. Turbines are placed at these sluices to capture the energy as the water flows in and out. Construction of hydroelectric dams is expensive and may not be feasible due to the local geology. Additionally, when dams are constructed, the water level behind the dam rises, flooding out a large expanse of land. This may destroy culturally important sites or displace the people who live there. Construction of the Three Gorges Dam necessitated the relocation of over 1.24 million people. Dams are an impediment to fish migration, and the creation of the reservoir or lake can disrupt the habitats of terrestrial plants and animals. On the positive side, dams can help to regulate the flooding of rivers and mitigate the damage caused by them, as well as providing a large volume of water that can be used for raising fish stocks or for irrigation and agriculture, reservoirs are also a site for human recreation, like swimming and other water sports. Wind energy is the kinetic energy of air in motion, also called wind. Wind is the movement of air across the surface of the Earth, driven by areas of high and low pressure and density, thanks to the sun's differential heating of the Earth's surface. The atmosphere acts as a thermal engine absorbing heat at higher temperatures and releasing it at lower temperatures. Warming air masses with lower densities rise to greater altitudes and are replaced by cooler ones with greater density. It is this movement of air that turns the blade of a windmill, effectively the turbine itself, which rotates a generator. Almost all wind turbines have the same design horizontal axis wind turbine having an upward rotor of three blades attached to a nacelle on the top of a tall tubular tower. In 2019, windmills were responsible for nearly 5% of electricity generation worldwide. While this may not seem like much, just 10 years earlier in 2009, only about 1% of the world's electricity was generated by wind power. A wind farm is a group of wind turbines in the same location. A large wind farm may consist of several hundred individual wind turbines distributed over an extended area. The land between the turbines may be used for agricultural or other purposes. Offshore wind power is a wind farm in a large body of water, usually the sea. These installations can utilize the more frequent and powerful winds that are available in those locations and have less visual impact on the landscape than land-based projects. However, the construction and maintenance costs are considerably higher. Onshore wind farms can have a significant visual impact and impact on the landscape and habitat loss and fragmentation are the greatest potential impacts on wildlife. Thousands of birds and bats have been killed by wind turbine blades, though wind turbines are responsible for far fewer bird deaths than fossil fuel power stations. Wind turbines also generate noise. At a distance of 300 meters, this may be around 45 decibels, which is slightly louder than, louder than a refrigerator. Although peer-reviewed research has generally not supported these claims, there are anecdotal reports of negative health effects on people who live very close to wind turbines. A vertical axis wind turbine is a type of wind turbine where the main rotor shaft is set transverse to the wind, while the main components are located at the base of the turbine. This arrangement allows the generator and gearbox to be located close to the ground, facilitating service and repair. Computer modeling suggests that wind farms constructed using vertical axis wind turbines are 15% more efficient than conventional horizontal axis wind turbines, as they generate less turbulence. Turbines like these often suffer from the stall of the blades, as the angle at which the wind strikes them can vary rapidly. Also, in addition to the larger ground footprint they have, the vertically oriented blades can twist and bend each turn, shortening their usable lifetimes. 
Biomass is biological material derived from living or recently living organisms. It most often refers to plants or plant-derived materials and result from the storage of carbon compounds produced via photosynthesis. As an energy source, biomass can either be used directly via combustion to produce heat or indirectly after converting it to various forms of biofuel. Wood has been the largest biomass energy source and examples include forest residues such as dead trees, branches, and tree stumps. Yard clippings, wood chips, and even municipal solid waste, or garbage, also serve as sources for biomass. For many people, especially those in developing nations, biomass is the most significant subsistence energy source, important for cooking and heating. The two most common types of biofuel are bioethanol and biodiesel. Bioethanol is alcohol made by fermentation, mostly from carbohydrates produced in sugar or starch crops such as corn or sugarcane. Ethanol can be used as a fuel for vehicles in its pure form, but it is usually used as a gasoline additive to increase octane and improve vehicle emissions. Bioethanol is widely used in the U.S. and in Brazil. Biodiesel is produced from oils or fats and is the most common biofuel in Europe. It, too, can be used as a fuel in its pure form, but it is usually used as a diesel additive to reduce levels of particulate pollution, carbon monoxide, and hydrocarbons from diesel-powered vehicles. Carbon, like all matter, is cycled through living and non-living systems. Biogeochemical cycling of carbon in it results being incorporated into the biomass of living things, or as part of compounds in the atmosphere or water, or as part of rock or minerals in the Earth's crust. Photosynthesis in producers is responsible for removing carbon from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, and incorporating it into their biomass. Millions of years ago, photosynthetic organisms removed carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, incorporated it into their biomass, died, and were then buried beneath the surface of the Earth. That carbon was removed from circulation, stored underground, locked away for millions and millions of years. That is, until the Industrial Revolution began just about two and a half centuries ago. Combusting fossil fuels results in a net increase in the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, since it returns to circulation the carbon that had been locked away. Modern biomass, on the other hand, does not increase the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, as the carbon dioxide that is released when it is combusted was only just recently incorporated into a modern plant's biomass. Most electricity production involves some method for making water hot to make steam that, under pressure, rotates a turbine and a generator. Geothermal energy, in that regard, is no different. Because of geologic processes like plate tectonics and the decay of radioactive elements in the Earth's crust, considerable thermal energy is present. Geothermal heating, using water from hot springs, for example, has been used for bathing since Paleolithic times and for space heating since ancient Roman times. More recently, geothermal power, a term used for the generation of electricity from geothermal energy, has gained in, a, in its importance. It is estimated that the Earth's geothermal resources are theoretically more than adequate to supply humanity's energy needs, although only a very small fraction is currently being profitably exploited, often in areas near tectonic plate boundaries or where hot spots are present. Geothermal power stations, like this one in the Philippines and this one in Iceland, contributed to the nearly 16,000 megawatts of electricity generation in 2020. Geothermal plants function on a fairly simple premise. Cool water is pumped down through a pipe system installed in the earth. The water is heated, 
before being returned to the surface as steam under pressure. The pressurized steam is used to, you guessed it, rotate a turbine that is connected to an electrical generator. A technology with the potential to produce energy in the future, if challenges can be overcome, is a hydrogen fuel cell. Hydrogen fuel cells produce electricity by combining hydrogen and oxygen atoms. The hydrogen reacts with oxygen across an electrochemical cell, similar to that of a battery, to produce electricity, water, and small amounts of heat. Check out the video linked above to learn more about how they work. Fuel cells like these remain an attractive research avenue due to the fact that they do not contribute to climate change while they are operating, since the only emission is water. Unfortunately, however, at this time, the technology is still prohibitively expensive to scale up to commercial operation. Additionally, although hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, here on Earth, producing it does require the input of energy. Hydrogen fueling stations generally receive deliveries of hydrogen by truck from hydrogen suppliers. The hydrogen fuel is hazardous because of the low ignition energy and high combustion energy of hydrogen, and because it tends to leak easily from tanks. Explosions at hydrogen filling stations have been reported. And because of the lack of a robust infrastructure to produce and transport hydrogen fuel, an interruption at a hydrogen supply facility can shut down multiple fueling stations. As part of a more sustainable future for energy consumption, two aspects of that future are important, production and conservation. How electricity and fuels are produced is reflected in the changes those industries are undergoing. Increasingly, consumers are expecting and demanding that a greater proportion of the energy they consume is produced through new renewable methods. Also, governments around the world can implement policies to promote the growth of industries in the renewable sector while perhaps discouraging growth in fossil fuel use. Since 2000, wind power has experienced dramatic growth to become one of the fastest growing in those two decades. Solar power since 2010 has also seen substantial growth, resulting in the cost to produce it decreasing. The second component of sustainability is one that the consumer has direct control over. What a consumer chooses to purchase or the businesses they opt to support can help or hinder an industry. Purchasing a more energy efficient appliance versus one that is less so is a choice that results in an energy savings. In some cases, the consumer is limited to a choice that is mandated by a government policy, such as the one that requires phasing out of less efficient light bulbs. How goods, building materials, and services are produced and consumed comes in a variety of forms. As sustainable methods and technologies improved, the conservation of energy and efficiency of energy requiring goods is reflected. Let's look at a few examples of how this is currently being accomplished. Water use and water heating is made possible by lower flow shower heads, dual flush toilets, and tankless water heaters that are more energy efficient so they don't continuously heat large volumes of water. The types of building materials and methods used is another example. Windows with two or more panes help to limit the transfer of heat into or out of a building. Green roofs, like the one around the Issaquah High School Library, serve several purposes for a building, such as absorbing rainwater, providing insulation, creating a habitat for wildlife, and decreasing stress of the people around the roof by providing a more aesthetically pleasing landscape. Additionally, green roofs can help to lower urban air temperatures and mitigate the heat island effect. The orientation of a building, its roof construction, and its windows 
is important in taking advantage of the angle of the sun's rays in the wintertime, reducing heating costs, while in the summer, blocking out those rays, keeping the interior of the building cooler. Energy Star is a program run by the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the U.S. Department of Energy that promotes energy efficiency. The program provides information on the energy consumption of products and devices using different standardized methods. The Energy Star label is found on more than 75 certified product categories, including appliances, homes, commercial buildings, and industrial plants. In the lighting category, the use of more efficient light bulbs, such as compact fluorescent and LED ones, reduces the amount of electricity required to operate them. And even installing motion detectors ensures efficient use of lights only when rooms are occupied. A well-known category of sustainable design includes hybrid or fully electric cars. In the late 1990s, the Toyota Prius was the first mass-produced hybrid vehicle. Since then, over 6 million of them have been sold. More recently, Tesla has revolutionized the electric car market, having sold nearly 500,000 vehicles since production began in 2009, helping it to become a trillion-dollar company. Finally, public transportation. Most effective in high-density population centers like London, more fuel-efficient buses, the subway system in New York City, and the above-ground trolley system in Amsterdam help to reduce the number of vehicles on the road, conserving fuel use. In order for public transit systems to be accepted and used by citizens and visitors, they must be reliable, clean, and, of course, reasonably priced. And with that, Unit 6 has come to a close. Thanks for watching. Take care.